Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third episode in the Google Lunar Team in the Google Lunar X Prize Team Hangouts. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay, and I'm host, your host this week. And joining me are members of Team Indus and Team Hokuto. Um, Today, we're going to talk about how the face of exploration is changing. Uh, it used to be that when you talked about space exploration, people imagined, well, America versus the Soviet Union. Fifty years later, uh, well, the Soviet Union no longer exists. America and Russia are allies. And we have entirely new faces from all corners of the planet helping us explore. Uh, Along with talking about that, we're going to find out about how both of these teams are working towards uh, various of the milestone prizes within the Google, Lu Google Lunar X Prize competition. And we'd encourage questions from all of you. If you'd like to ask our guests anything, please uh, use the Q&A app available on YouTube. No matter where you're watching this, you should see a little Q&A app uh, over the left-hand corner of the video. Uh, click on that to send us your question. Uh, we are also following Twitter, and you're encouraged to tweet out anything of interest that you see in the show or ask any questions. Uh, just remember to use the hashtag GLXP or at tweet GLXP. Um, Gentlemen, thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day, Tuesday going into Wednesday for some of you. This is truly a globe-spanning hangout going from 10 a.m. here in Central Time in the USA all the way over to midnight in Tokyo. Um, I'm going to uh, start by asking you to introduce yourself, Rul. You're uh, with Team Indus. And and uh, can you introduce your team a little bit and tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Thanks, Pamela. Thanks for hosting this uh, hangout. My name is Rahul Narayan. I'm the team lead at Team Indus. Uh, we are the only team out of India. We've now been with GLXP for three years. We made so sorry. Can you be a little bit louder? Your your audio is quite soft. Hi, so this is Rahul Narayan. I'm team lead uh, at Team Indus. Uh, we're the team out of India. We've been now with GLXP for three years. We made some progress. We've had some hits and we've had some misses. We'll talk about them today. Thank you. And uh, Takishi, would you please introduce uh, your team as well? Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Takish Hakamada. I am a team leader of a uh, team named Hakuto, which is based in Tokyo, Japan. And uh, uh, development actually, robot development actually uh, conducted in Sendai. It's a north part of the Japan. It's also famous for the, the big earthquake, earthquake several years ago. Uh, we are, well, uh, collaborating with the Tokyo University for the development. And uh, uh, luckily, we recently selected one of the, well, uh, editorial milestone prizes team. And we are currently conducting and uh, developing a new robot for that prize. Now, what's interesting about your team is that you actually are a combination of uh, multiple teams that started on the X Prize. Can you speak a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Uh, the we actually we established in uh, Europe first. Then uh, the European team European team members uh, of uh, young professional in ESA European Space Agency. Uh, built built our well team in 2008. However, they don't have uh, ability to build a rover, so they asked to uh, Professor Yoshida in Tokyo University to develop a uh, rover in Japan. Then uh, Japan and the European teams uh, combined together into one team, but uh, recently. Uh, Europeans' effort have stopped, 
So uh, we converted our team into purely Japanese teams and well, still going our airport for the moon. And and your team in Japan uh, includes one rogue Canadian at least, and and this is yeah. John Walker, who's over on uh, uh, your lab site. I'm guessing with uh, part of your entry into the mobility prize sitting behind him. I'm guessing. That's right. Uh, behind me is our engineering model. Actually, we're working on this version. Uh, I'm John. I'm from Canada. And I'm a PhD student at Tohoku University. I'm, this, I'm in the space robotics lab that Takeshi just mentioned. So we're in charge of the rover development here in terms of engineering. And we work with the team members in Tokyo. And what I love about this particular combination is we have with Team Indus uh, a, a team that's in the process of uh, striving towards both the landing and imaging milestone prizes, and uh, with with Team Hakuto, the uh, a team that's striving towards the mobility prize. Uh, it's it's called a mobility prize instead of a rover prize, simply because you don't have to rove. You could you could hover, you could hop, you could use any other uh, technique. You are uh, actually choosing to rove to get there, and. All of your teams are showing the importance of, of teamwork in how you get to the moon. Um, Roel, I'm going to return to you and have you talk about uh, how is it that, that your team is, is planning to, to get to the moon and who are your partners that are making, making this happen for you? We've completed our design, what we call as a preliminary design review. Uh, that qualifies our, our lander or the landing system. Uh, so from point A, which is off the east coast of India, uh, we would launch on a particular rocket. That's a medium lift rocket, which is going to take us to low Earth orbit. Uh, well, not over the north orbit. It's going to take us to an orbit around Earth. From there, our spacecraft is going to boost itself to an orbit around Moon. Then it's going to the lower Earth's orbit, begin a descent, uh, navigate to the point that it needs to, and then do a soft touch down. So the lander is point A to point B, which is from Shar all the way. That that you're you're fading out a little bit. Could you? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that last bit a little bit louder? Yeah. So so it's a point-to-point -point delivery mechanism. It begins from the east coast of India and uh, heads all the way to China Ceridium. So you start with a PSLV rocket, and then your landing system uh, takes your payload all the way to China Ceridium. So we have a three to four hour checkout process there post landing, and then we deploy our rover, uh, which goes on to, to traverse 500 meters, do the imaging, send the images back, complete the task, and hopefully be the first team to do so in the GLA. Uh, that... your question, on your question about partners, so I, I, I think we've been very fortunate, and we think. Uh, as opposed to, let's say, America, where you have almost a dozen teams, so uh, which is the national team is a question. For us, that's not a question. And, and we are the only team. And uh, we've been very, very fortunate to have had a lot of folks. Uh, so this is talent. This is uh, young graduates from the to put the jobs to come work with us. Uh, so we've been fortunate in that front to be able to attract great talent. Uh, on the engineering side, we we very uh, you know, we've been lucky to announce that you know, LNT Aerospace, one of the largest uh, aerospace engineering companies out of India, the local company, they've been helping us along for almost two years now, and uh, we're just in the process of confirming uh, a partnership uh, along with them, which would uh, help them, you know, uh, get them to help us through the engineering. So they're great with structures. They offer to do a big portion of the structures of the lot on the integration. And that's that's been a good thing. We have more partnership agreements on way. We will announce them shortly. And and that's the wonderful thing about it, space exploration is it's a constantly growing community. Um, over in in Japan, uh, 
how how many different uh, partners have have you found? Are where are you launching from? I guess I'd love to hear the history of where you're going with with your system now. Well, um, um, actually, talk. Or, oh, sorry, it's Keshi. Oh, you can go. Uh, yeah, we can't exactly talk about where we're launching from yet. Very soon, I think. But um, as Keshi mentioned, we're only focusing on the rover design now. Uh, European. Part of the team is basically dropped out and just returned to control of pyramids in Tokyo. And so we're focusing on the rover design, but an interesting part of the competition is uh, it's created a demand for launch providers. So it's actually possible to partner with either another team or another company instead of building your own landing. So that's our strategy at this moment. Now, one of the really interesting things that I've discovered as, as I've read about each of you and as I've uh, learned more and more about the, the people involved across all the different teams within the Google Lunar X Prize Challenge, um, many of you have attended the International Space University. Uh, John, uh, you're, you're the youngest in the group, so I'm going to turn to you first. What, what drew you to the International Space University, and how do you think it's, it's affected your involvement in this program? Uh, well, I wouldn't be here without it. That's certainly true. Um, so I graduated from undergrad uh, almost 10 years ago now. And after working for seven or eight years, I decided to go back to school and try and pursue career in the aerospace industry, something that just never left my mind, I always wanted to. Um, so I did that by attending the International Space Team University, and that was in 2010. And my professor here in Japan is actually a professor there also. So when I attended the Space University in France, I met him. That turned into an internship. Um, I enjoyed the research here, so I was able to come back Turn it into a doctoral program. And so I started with ISC. And I've seen over the past years with my own career that projects like the International Space University, uh, scientific conferences like the Lunar and Planetary Society Conference here in the United States, all of these are becoming more and more diverse um, as time goes on. And I think, in large part, this is due to the success of so many of the international science missions. Um, I, I know that uh, various members of Team Hakuto have, have been working on the Hayabusa project. Uh, how has your leadership in science helped influence this diversification of space exploration? Uh, well, I'm just entering my second year of my doctoral program, but I haven't actually had the chance travel conferences yet. But my so professor is now just about every week. We have many partnerships, um, including DLR in Germany and uh, from Vietnamese universities. So we just at this point I don't think you even have to try. There's just so many international connections through this lab and team. To to Kishi, what has your experience been uh, uh, over the years, have you seen more and more um, of, of your colleagues uh, stepping forward with space exploration? How, how have you seen um, the field change as more of you have become role models to the next generation? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, uh, I, I studied aerospace engineering in college and graduate school, but after that I entered a consulting firm. So I uh, left space industry, but I came back to this field again. So I, I like to uh, more and more people will come to this field again after where well, they had a, well uh, capability to do project and uh, well regarding the well uh, the role model we sometimes uh, provide a well, space class 
to the elementary school and the high school too. And when every time I I go I went to the school, uh, every child, children, uh, well, get very interested in the well robotics and science, and they are very uh, they say they very interested in the field, and they want to uh, work work for that field in the future. And so that's the things we want to do uh, in parallel with the development of our own robot. Do you think that more people can imagine a, a future of Japanese astronauts and robotic explorers than they could 10 years ago because of the success of of what your team is doing and Hayabusa and all of the efforts of JAXA? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think so. Uh, it's, for example, the after Hayabusa's success two years ago, uh, amazingly we had four or five movies telling about the story of Hayabusa, and most of many many people are interested in the space uh, exploration and sciences. So I, I want to keep this uh, uh, well, keep this uh, what can I say uh, movement and uh, increase more people get in, involved in the space industry. I think we were really lucky with our timing here because, uh, as you mentioned, just a couple of years ago, uh, Hayabusa successfully returned a sample from an asteroid. And coming off the tail of that, there's been many documentaries here, but also a huge surge in the pop popularity of things like space-related manga and anime. And uh, we actually had the authors of one manga book, which is a comic book uh, called Space Brothers. Came and visited one of the colleagues in the lab here, so there's definitely an interest in getting the science right. We're excited about it. And you're facing a, a similar sort of revolution in India. Uh, Raul, do you find that the successes of things like Chandrayaan and uh, all of your recent, all of your nation's recent launches, are making people more aware that India is a space-faring nation nowadays? I think you may be muted. And I'd, I'd remind you to speak loudly. And while he works on unmuting, you're still not unmuted. Um, I'd remind the audience that we will be taking questions. I see a couple coming up, and I'm going to turn to those in a moment. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A app on YouTube or leave us a message on Twitter uh, using either the hashtag GLXP or by at tweeting GLXP. Are you with us now? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Be loud. Uh, okay. So yeah, uh, I, I I think uh, I think that ISRO has done a great job. They have very limited resources to do the missions and the projects that they do. Within those limited resources, they have managed to manage quite a few of these uh, launches. And uh, Chandrayaan one was a great success. It was followed widely. And uh, uh, you know, it's 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 the ecosystem that they have created, which has allowed us to go in, leverage some of that expertise, uh, possibly ride on their rocket to to be able to deliver our mission. When you start out a, a project or a company, I don't think you start out by saying we're going to inspire people. So we didn't do that either. Uh, but we be mindful of the fact that what we're doing uh, is 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 potentially something that can. Uh, you know, make other uh, other young people look at this and say, "Hey, if these guys can do it, why can't we? If if this can be done using so few resources out of India, then maybe we can also go for our own moonshot." So we'd love to believe this is a moonshot. It is not a long shot, 
and we'll continue trying for it. I, I think that may be the, the best way I've ever heard it phrased. This isn't a long shot, it's a moon shot. That's, that's something we all need to remember. Um, it's not reaching for the stars, it's reaching for the nearest rocky world. Now, now the getting there um, may be the easiest part. The landing safely without self-destructing your spacecraft, the roving successfully and then sending back a message are all technological stri uh, hurdles that you're all striving to, to accomplish different parts of. Um, we have a question coming in from Blair Gordon who asks, uh, what communications are you using um, between the moon and Earth? Um, so, so how is it that you're working uh, to get your signals back and forth between the different worlds? This for me? Uh, either one of you. Let's start with you, Raul. Okay, great. Yeah, so, uh, so it's a standard, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a standard, fairly standard X-band communication link that we're using from moon to back to Earth to ground station, and and then we have a, a you know S-band communication link between the lander. So and what's S-band? You're you're starting to speak technical. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> the audience that would, would know what. Yeah, so so it's a it's a it's a high frequency band which allows you to do greater uh, data rate at long distances. That's uh, what X band does for you. It is it is line of sight. S band is a is a relatively low frequency, so we're going to use that, and it, it, it it's difficult to use that for longer distance. So S band is for between the rover and the lander, and X band is between the lander and and home. So okay. that's that's what we're doing. Do you, uh, do you have a network of uh, radio dishes or a dedicated dish for getting the signal back from from your uh, craft on the moon? So we are. Well, my background is software. So in software, we love to believe that you could do it all from one laptop. Right? Uh, so that's that's how we started designing it. So so there is a strategy which says we could do this using one single dish out of Bangalore. You know, right outside Bangalore. Uh, so so that's the hack. Uh, but but uh, optimal mission uh, you know uh, uh, optimal mission operations would require us to uh, use at least one other ground station uh, that should be a NASA Goldstone we haven't yet started talking to them but yeah that's on the somewhere down the roadmap hopefully we start talking to them hopefully they like what we do and you know they offer to do it for us for free or something like that maybe a few dollars or what <laughs> so let's see how that works out. Uh, John, can you address uh, what the communications methods will be for, for your lander? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we're using a service provider uh, for the landing part of the mission. So the communication to Earth would be via them. And at this university, we also have the capability uh, for communication directly with the lander, potentially, um, in addition to the provider's network. And then what we're focusing on now is communication between our rovers and our interface on someone else's launch and lander vehicle. So that is going to be entirely done by us. Um, we have that in development now in parallel with the milestone prize. And since we have two rovers, I'm not sure if you can see, um, they're actually tethered together. So communication between the two rovers is by a physical connection, uh, but also both of them have radios that are capable of talking to our interface in the lander. So basically, we have two communication paths once we're on the surface. So some redundancy there. So uh, Takeshi, with with your team, what? Um are all of the different pieces that you have going on. I've seen these fabulous uh, pictures of, of your team um, with all of the, the wheels, with all of the fans coming out of them. How, how is it that you went uh, and, and came up with all of these designs and how many different people had to be brought in to make that rover that we're seeing behind John a reality? Well, uh, we have we has we have so far uh, about 20 engineers working in Tokyo and in Sendai 
and we've already built uh, five or seven uh, rovers. And the, the two rovers behind John right now, you can show the, these are the, the latest ones. And we are also building some other new, newest rovers for the milestone prizes too. So this this is a picture that you shared with me earlier today, um, and I'm going to scroll through some of these. You have large rover, and then um, the moon raker traveling out in front of it. Um, can you explain the the two uh, dual rover model that you're looking at? Sure. So moon raker is actually the larger one. The smaller one is called Tetris. Um, so the idea is that Moonraker can tow Tetris to an area of interest. And what we're really interested in on the moon is potential skylights or caves. Uh, these can be really interesting to research and also potential places for human habitat or lunar base. Um, so our basic, basic idea is to travel with Moonraker and Tetris in this tow configuration on the screen right now the edge of uh, something that we think is a cave. And then Tetris is tethered to Moonraker. You can actually lower it into a dangerous area or a potential cave or potential skylights. So if you can imagine, Moonraker can travel around the outside of a crater or a cave, and Tetris can be lowered in various points. Uh, so this is the potential to map a cave to really get some good information. So the, these are really neat ideas that, that you have um, coming forward. And I, I simply love the simplicity of your wheels. Um, the, the lunar surface is not kind, and it's not easy to get across. And your wheels do it in a very straightforward kind of way. Um, landing and finding caves uh, and other, other interesting features is, is certainly uh, one of the challenges each team is facing, the where am I going to go with this awesome set of, of instrumentation that I'm building. Uh, Raul, you mentioned that uh, you have a landing site picked out. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about your landing site and how it was chosen? So, uh, we chose it the easiest way possible. What is the easiest place to land? And uh, <laughs> it's a place where people have gone before and it's not too difficult, so you know. Uh, that's that's probably the way that you pick it up. So yeah, and then a little bit more science went into it. So you, you figure out what's the dispersion that you have on your sensors, how bad can it get, and you multiply that by five, and you say, okay, I need a patch of hundred kilometers by hundred kilometers. How many? Can you be a little bit louder? You're you're tapering off again. I'm sorry. Okay. So you you know you start with your sensors and say what is the possible you know movement that I can get as I'm trying to go into land. And you say, how bad can it get? So you say it could be 10 kilometers. Multiply that by 10 to get 100. So you start looking for patches which are 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. And then you look for patches which are easy, as in they're flat and you don't have you know, any mountains or huge caves or any such thing coming along. And and you know you you start mapping it. It's, uh, the moon is fairly well mapped, fairly well mapped, uh, or, or whatever you can see on the net. From the data that is published, a lot of the data that has been published from the LRO mission, uh, missions before that, a little bit of data from uh, the lunar core days. So using that, and you could put it in the matrix, and you say which is the easiest place to put it. Uh, and that helped us pick the, the current site that we have. It also happens to be the site where the, Jap the, the Chinese mission went to a couple of months. So, so that's 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 kind of how we went about picking our site. No interesting people there from whatever little we understand of that site. We requested for greater detail uh, on on the you know uh, the photographs that are available. We don't have that as yet. It's not interesting. Uh, it's not an interesting location, but it is a location on that you know rocky planet close to us. Uh, and the intent of this mission is to prove that it's possible to go there. I think once we prove it's possible to go there, we will probably go back in later on and then try and explore the cave. That's that's kind of how we. Look. I, I like the the safety of the 
Uh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there to a nice big flat surface first, and and then we'll try and go back and do really interesting stuff later. Uh, there, there's many different ways to approach this. Um, I, I have to admit, you're you're approaching going to the moon the way I approach software development. I'm going to do this and make it work and do this. Um, sometimes you can't do that, and sometimes your partner's like, okay, we're going to go here first. Um, that that's a good way to approach it. Now with with Team Hakuta, you're uh, you're going with someone else's lander. Are you going to be part of the decision making process on figuring out where your mission's going to land? Uh, do you know for certain yet that there'll be caves nearby? Well, uh, because we cannot disclose the landing service partner yet, so we cannot say exactly where we are going. But uh, one of our well, potential Radix site is uh, the sc called Skylight with the uh, well uh, entrance to the potential cave. The reason why we are aiming to the Skylight is uh, uh, Skylight was found by the first Japanese uh, scientist using the data provided by uh, Kaguya, which is a uh, well Luna. Uh, satellite. So uh, the skylight is very uh, key places for the Japanese wells future science mission. So we are looking forward uh, opportunity to go there. And and for those who don't know about the lunar skylights. Uh, the moon far in its past was actually volcanic. We don't usually think about that, but some of the more amazing features that we see in the high resolution images coming back from a variety of different NASA and, and ESA and JAXA and Indy, all of these different global missions are, are returning images of um, lava tubes and other volcanic features. And in some places, these lava tubes have cave-ins, have breaks, and we're able to see into underground cavities. And one of the unfortunate parts about the moon is it's not protected from radiation. Here on the planet Earth, we have our magnetosphere, we have our atmosphere, and together, these two different things, they protect us from the sun's high-energy particles, they protect us from high-energy light. Um, on the moon, you're outside of the Earth's magnetic field. The moon is old, it doesn't have enough of a magnetic field residually in its rocks to protect anything from radiation. But if you can go underground, if you can get into one of these caves or caverns, that potentially is the safe place for future astronauts to be able to reside when the surface isn't necessarily a safe place to be. So I think everyone following lunar science and lunar exploration are desperately excited for some team, some national space program to just get into one of those caverns and finally start exploring. Um, each of your teams had had to make different choices on where to to emphasize your efforts, where to focus your efforts. Uh, how is it that you made the choice to focus on on cave exploration with with your two part uh, rover uh, with with Team Akuto? Uh, well, the four wheel rover has been in development for almost five years now, and the two wheel rover. This is heritage designs from this lab, but actually it's only starting about one year ago that we started to think about the possibility of uh, checking the cave. And that's because in the last year or two, there's been just a lot of pandemic, or a lot of excitement about searching caves. Add to what you were saying before, the temperature inside the caves is likely uh, much better for humans as well, much less harsh both at the high end and the low end. So it's really exciting to think we might be. And, um, the rovers, now that we have that as an architecture, it seems like kind of an obvious choice because it's a doubly redundant system. And both of them are able to operate on their own. So we're hoping, even though we hope to land next to a cave or a hole, basically, um, 
you can mitigate some of that risk by having key chances. So, Raul, in, in looking at, at what your team was uh, going to be focusing on, you have the imaging milestone project that you've been selected to pursue, the landing milestone. Um, how did you find uh, people that, that would focus your team's strengths in these areas? Well, that's, that's a very easy decision for startups. You have just that many resources to put behind a problem, and uh, we uh, although we started with the rover, with, the, with all of that, we very quickly said uh, getting there is, is the important piece. Let's put all the resources that we have behind that. So we've, it's been an exercise of starting with Wikipedia research all the way to where we are now. So it's three years uh, of, of having started from Wikipedia research to where we are now and having put all our resources uh, behind the lander. So which is why I, when I, the PMP came up, I'm sorry. I, I love the notion that your project started with Wikipedia research, because I, I think all of us do that, but to hear you actually admit that is fabulous. Um, Don't we do all that for experts everything? need to spend some time editing Wikipedia, because we all use it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so the resources for, for a small firm which is starting up, the resources, you know, make the decisions for you. And we were a very, very small group, then we're still a small group. But we've grown to about 30 people right now. But when we were five, six, seven, we were all on Wikipedia trying to figure out how did the Russians land, how many times the Americans land, how many times did they get it wrong. So that's 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 kind of how we where we started. And uh, uh, once once we were, once we did submit our papers for the for the milestone prize. We realized that hey, we're really, really behind on the rover, so let's get some resources. Behind them. So we now have a small little team, uh, three of them, all of them complaining all the time that they need about 16 more people just to finish that piece. I said <laughs> we're definitely not getting 16 people to add to the rover team, and uh, we've could done some work. I think our designs are up for that. We can start prototyping. I'm sorry, I can't show you anything of the rover right now, but we'll start prototyping the rover soon. And probably have some pictures out for you. And and your camera, can you tell us anything about that? You're also part of the camera milestone selected teams. Wasn't that the easiest one to get? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, I, building cameras is difficult. Otherwise, so much effort wouldn't go into it. Can you tell us about what design choices you made? Yeah, so. Uh, that, that's kind of where our ecosystem comes in handy. So the reason why I call it easy is, uh, is that India, or, or ISRO rather, has been doing a lot of satellites, and a lot of them are Earth observation satellites. So cameras are some things that they did, uh, you know, they've been doing for 40 years. The suppliers who can help you, they're the people who work at ISRO and have retired and are available to guide your team. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to run into a couple of them who said, hey, uh, what is it that you're trying to do, and why are you complicating this? It really isn't that complicated. Just stick to the basics, get the job done, get out of there. And uh, what was great to note is that uh, a lot of them, uh, one would imagine that they they would do uh, they, that they'd be they were very straight jacketed. They were not, and 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 it's great to see a hacker streak in them, and to say, hey, you don't need to buy space grid uh, sensors, you can probably get commercial sensors, industrial sensors, put them together, and your mission is, our mission, nominal mission life is about 30 days, maybe 50. Uh, and they said, you know, it's right. Unless something catastrophic happens, in which case, you did fly a space grid sensor. That's right. So you, you do those trade-offs. There is no black and white. Uh, it's always a trade-off. Yep. Uh, I'm afraid your audio cut off. I still see your your face moving, but your audio is gone. Right. So yeah. So we we, we did have to make those trade offs on 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 what uh, you know what are the risks that you're gonna take by way of, of building this and the mission life and the nominal mission life and how well it could perform in case of So that's why I call it relatively. Easy. So so with the the rover pair that, that the Japanese team is working on, um, your rover doesn't have that, that quintessential uh, 
dual-eyed stereoscopic vision that so many people are used to seeing um, from NASA spacecraft and ESA spacecraft. Uh, what was the uh, approach that you took in um, giving vision to your rovers? That's right. We're using an omnidirectional camera for Moon Ranger. Uh, yes, you can see silver mirrors sticking up at the top of the larger rover. So there's a camera pointing up at that mirror, and the mirror allows the camera to see 360 degrees around the entire rover. Um, and then in addition, in front of the rover here, there's a laser rangefinder to fuse that data together. Um, and the interesting thing about the mirror camera system is, even though it's a single camera, as the rover moves, we're able to fairly easily create 3D information. Um, and again, that's in 360 degrees instead of just in one direction ahead of the rover. And then in addition, because that's a little hard on a, a computer terminal to take all that information in as an operator, uh, we have an Oculus Rift-based prototype uh, viewer for this. So when you're operating the rover, you can actually look around 360 degrees. Uh, you can look at the rover's wheels. You can look ahead. You can look back. So it turned out to be a very good design choice. I I love that you're using Oculus Rift as as part of how you're doing this. Um, yeah. Again, we ran into some really good timing with that coming out just at the perfect time. Uh, so one of my colleagues here has been working on that full time. So, the so it sounds like you're fly by wire then, and uh, not a uh, automated rover. Uh, how was the choice made to do fly by wire in, instead of automated? Uh, we do have some autonomy. Uh, as I mentioned, the laser rangefinder in front of Moonraker is able to detect hazards. And, um, the very minimum, we always have emergency stop situation for the hazardous situation. Um, and in parallel with our milestone prize theory, we're developing some more advanced algorithms. Um, we have a lot of those coming out of this lab already. Um, robots used it for disaster recovery, recovery situations, for example. So it integrates some of that technology back into our robots. So we're, we're at the point where we're roughly a year away from when teams are hoping to start landing on the moon, um, start their, their first attempts, in some cases their only attempts, I think in most cases their only attempts to land on the moon. Um, as you gear up for this next year, what are some of the things that you can share that you're most excited that you're going to be able to do um, prior to actually getting to the moon? And don't forget, those of you who are out there watching this, you can use the Q&A app to send in any questions you may have for our teams. So Rahul, I'm going to start with you and remind you to please be loud. Uh, what are the, some of the things that you're most looking forward to as you build and test uh, your lander in the coming year? There's, there's fun stuff happening on, on our outreach. So we're trying to get students involved uh, by you know crowdsourcing uh, so we're definitely crowdsourcing talent. That's something that we, we think we've done very well till now. Now we'd like to start crowdsourcing actual hardware. So that's something that we're going to do. That's that's a fun outreach program that we've, we've, we've been you know, uh, designing and working on. We should get that going uh, as we get into you know, the, the, the accomplishment round of the Milestone Prize. So that's, that's going to be interesting. We're looking forward to finalizing the contract with our launch provider. That's a big one. Uh, for us, and that begins, hopefully begins a long countdown to the launch pad. And uh, uh, we're doing some other outreach in, in you know, traditional media on possibly television, uh, uh, possibly in local languages. So let's see how that plays out. So we're doing, we're doing a lot of that stuff. All that is, is to make this really interesting. All that is to gain and garner the support of as many people as we can. And uh, we can really look forward to it. Uh, so what about Team Hokuto? What are some of the things that you're most excited to be facing in the coming year? Um, actually, these two rover designs behind me are pretty mature by now. Um, it showed some pictures of field testing before. 
uh, so the basic design is almost locked in place. We're designing flight models right now. So in the next couple of months, we'll actually be building parts that are almost ready to fly. And a lot of parts are actually close to that already, or at that level. Uh, we have a lot of experience here with microsets. So we're able to import some of that technology as well. Um, so yeah, right now we're working on some uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic light models, pre flight models, and we'll start to have some pretty impressive looking rover soon. That, that all sounds great. We, ha we have a great comment coming in from the internet. Uh, Terry Bradford writes, lunar lava tubes are awesome sauce. Um, but then goes on to ask, does looking through a mirror make movement difficult? So uh, you, you mentioned using the Oculus Rift to, to basically allow a, a person to more readily um, deconvolve all of the information coming in. What other challenges do you get from using the mirror to take the images? Um, well, spreading our image out over 360 degrees, it does lower the resolution of what we're seeing in a different direction. Um, that's fairly limited anyway, because it data rates and uh, the difficulty of having space ready hardware. Um, but that doesn't look like it's a very large drawback. Um, in addition, we have Tetris, which has a more conventional forward facing camera. So we're able to kind of augment the two cameras in your systems together. And, and that actually brings us to, to the next question coming in from Adam Synergy, uh, who asks, will exploring skylights and lava tubes uh, present problems for communications? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we're using two new rovers. Um, so you can imagine the Moonraker is able to sit at the edge of uh, a cavern or a skylight. Communication over the tether system should allow us to still make contact with Tetris, even though it could be in a, a radio shadow. That sounds like a great way to, to approach the problem. There's nothing like a hard link when the, the radio line of sight is getting confused by cave walls. I think anyone who's ever been in a subway knows uh, underground is not a good place to try and use uplinks. Um, one of the things that, that, that you brought up with your crowdsourcing role is uh, you're engaging school children, you're engaging uh, the public in your project. And this is actually part of one of the incentives that the Google Lunar X Prize has put out is, is the diversity goal. Um, can you tell our audience, and I'd remind you to speak loudly, I'm so sorry for the hardware issues, um, a little bit about the diversity challenge and, and how it is that your team's working towards that? So the diversity challenge is defined in the MTA, and uh, I believe that there are, you know, they're going to bring about greater resolution to it. But I don't think we're doing this for the diversity challenge. Uh, we're doing this because we want great talent. Uh, very few people out there who know what we're doing. So whenever we do get an opportunity to talk about ourselves, whenever we get an opportunity to talk about what we're doing, and about GLXP, XPRIZE Foundation, we take that opportunity. We need, we need great talent, and you really need to be able to reach out to where that great talent is. You need a little bit of money, and you need a whole lot of support. So uh, for us, the outreach is about the support, and it's about finding you know, uh, talent uh, which is hidden out there, which thinks that they can do a great algorithm, but maybe it's not for space. So you know, if you listen and write to us, uh, we've had a lot of folks uh, who've written to us and, and had the skill set which could help us, and uh, you know we'd be happy to get you on. That yeah. that's awesome. I I love the message of it's it's not about purposely going out to to do education, but pur purposely reaching out and saying you might have the skills we need, so join us. That's that's not a message that we hear very often, and. I, I love hearing it. Um, one of the things that, that's making this Hangout series possible is we're all sitting here speaking English. Uh, I know India's national language is largely English. Um, Canada, where John's from, clearly English. Um, 
but not everyone in the prize is a native English speaker. Um, have, have you had any international challenges? Are you finding that nowadays we really are one world united by, um, I guess we call it conference English, the English that we've all learned to speak to, to work with our collaborators around the world? Um, it hasn't been a big issue for me here. Everybody's pretty accommodating of my poor Japanese skills. Uh, 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 Takeshi, have, have you had any issues in, in your travels and in working uh, internationally between Europe and Japan? Um, mm -hmm. Are there any global boundaries left that you're hitting? Well, uh, uh, well, language barrier is still very high in Japan because it's very, well, Japan is very monocultural, even in, in the aspect of language, too. So, uh, so we have uh, many Japanese team, team members as well as international, well, uh, foreign members, too. Uh, the one big challenge for us is the uh, Japanese team member, most of the Japanese team member doesn't have experience to work with uh, foreign people. So it's kind of hard to challenge that, but it's very good chance uh, also for normal Japanese people to work on the foreign people and competing in the global environment with the other teams. It's a side effect of this challenge that um, the Google Lunar X Prize uh, competition is bringing together 18 teams spanning the world, trying to get off this world into the moon, uh, all struggling along in English um, as best we can. Um, and building a global spacefaring society. We, we have just a couple more minutes left. And I'd actually like to ask each of you where you hope to see things 10 years from now as we're striving towards whatever the next lunar involved X Prize might be. What, what are you hoping to see in, in your future? Um, Raul, I'll turn to you for this one as a start. Now you start getting to the heavier questions. <laughs> right. Um, well, as a startup, we just hope to survive to the end of next year and somehow get to the launch, but hopefully launch and hopefully land. Uh, Ten years down the line, uh, and I'm gonna, you know, basically say stuff that I read off the internet somewhere. You know, not, not my, not uh, <laughs> disclaimer, not my thoughts. So this is this is quite like we believe this is quite like the aeronautics in the early. Uh, 20th century, so you know it was about now that that you know people were using aeroplanes for showboating, for a little bit of transport, for fun, whatever, whatever, whatever. And uh, 100 years hence, which is now, we're trying to do this, which is which some people call as just showboating. Why you're going there? You're not doing any science, and you're just looking for that. So maybe this is the triggering point. Maybe uh, people say, you know, if a 30 man or a 50 man team could do it in you know, 60 months or less, and for, you know, less than whatever, $50 million, then maybe a whole lot more people can do it, and then we start doing it over and over again. But here's the difference between a government mission and a private mission. So a government mission will do it for different reasons, and they keep doing it, and thanks to the government, we have this great Could you be a little louder? I'm losing you again, I'm sorry. Yeah, so thanks to the government, we have this great ecosystem and all the missions that have happened. When the private players start doing this, uh, they never get enough. So you do it once and you like it, you're probably going to do it over and over again. But, so that's the fun with, 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 with the private enterprises. And hopefully, uh, in the process of going to the moon, we can demonstrate it and be done in SLA, if you, will, if you may. You know, if it, that you could do it against service level agreement and there would be a fixed cost to it and there will be a fixed time. So if you can do that, there will be takers out there saying, let's go ahead and do this for this specific purpose. So uh, that's that's where we believe we're going to be if any of the team, GLXT team, manage to see, uh, maybe it does try to trigger a private space industry. Private space rate would be good fun. 
uh, you know, we'll be poking each other in the eyes, you know, hopefully nobody gets, gets hurt. Uh, and uh, yeah, 10 years down the line, if, if, GL, if any GLXP team manages to land on the moon and do, you know, 500 meters, maybe more, I think it is going to trigger uh, multitudes of private companies trying to go beyond Earth. Whether to the moon, whether to Mars, whether beyond, uh, that remains to be seen. But this could, you know, you would look back then and say this probably was a kidney. Well done, GLXP. It, it truly is remarkable to make this comparison between this century's uh, CANSATs, uh, CubeSats, Google Lunar X Prize missions to the moon. Um, commercial space today is, is the barnstormers of 100 years ago. Um, only instead of grannies in the backs of, of bi-winged airplanes, we now have grandma and grandpa buying tickets on Virgin Galactic and perhaps on one of your collaborators' uh, further traveling spacecraft in the future. I, I hope none of you end up in competition the way Pan Am and TWA fought it out uh, 50, 60 years ago. Um, but we definitely are moving towards less government, more commercial aviation innovation. And that's an awesome thing to think about. Um, Takishi, what, what are your hopes 10 years from now? Well, 10 years, well, the next year we're going to go into the moon. So we still have nine years <laughs> after that. So there's lots, lots of things to do. Uh, I think in 10 years, uh, very exciting activi activities is uh, showing up, including a suborbital flights and uh, going to the, well, moon and uh, potentially to Mars and uh, asteroid. I think most of the people doesn't have chance to go to the Mars at that point, but most of the people uh, start preparing for that. That even such a situation, I think it's very it will be very exciting future. It it is a, a new age that we're moving into. Um, We've been here for about an hour now, and, and I have to thank all three of you for doing such a fabulous job, uh, especially in the face of various audio issues. And thank you to the audience for staying with us throughout uh, these, these past many minutes. Um, we are going to take the next couple of weeks off for uh, the, well, basically spring break. Spring break happens globally, uh, or winter break for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we will be returning, uh, so stay tuned. Follow GLXP on Twitter, the Google Lunar X Prize on Google+, and we will keep you up to date on all that's new in our exploration of the moon and someday beyond. So thank you, gentlemen. This, this has been a, a fabulous past hour, and thank you, audience. Um, and don't forget to share this video. It's going to be archived on YouTube. Just send this Hangout link out, and uh, let's get more people thinking about exploring space. Uh, thank you again. <laughs>